hello beautiful community there is a piece in foreign affairs that reluctantly i've agreed to react to because quite a few of you have messaged me and asked that i do it's called the morality of ukraine's war is very murky the ethical calculations are less clear than you might think it's by stephen wald who is the belfer professor of international relations at harvard now what goes wrong with the piece is something we'll get to at the end and it's essentially that it lacks an account of agency it lacks an account of agency in the kremlin what the putin regime is up to which of course informs how we might respond to it before saying a bit more in this direction let's just um give ourselves a sample this is not going to be a systematic 45 minute video we'll hopefully be finished in under 15. so we'll just taste a few things from the piece and then um we'll look at what's gone wrong in it and what do we need to understand before we do that that we don't read pieces to debunk them and if we are in a position where it looks like we're debunking something we at least should not debunk it with cliches right even if cliches are on the right side the right side of what the right side of history well there's no right side of history but the right side of some issue um still shouldn't be argued for in cliches so quite a few quotes let's do it in hopefully under five minutes bear with me please so this is um paragraph two Ever since the war began, those who favor giving Ukraine whatever it takes for as long as it takes have sought to portray the war in the usual U.S. fashion as a straightforward contest between good and evil. In their telling, Russia is solely to blame for the war and Western policy had absolutely nothing to do with the resulting tragedy. Now, let's make a few minor notes as we go along. Of course, Western policy has plenty of things to do with why the war began in 2022 um that's just going to be inevitable what these things were um what kind of western failures or western challenges that built up let us say from the period of the collapse of the soviet union till now is something i won't analyze today they see the moral stakes as nearly infinite stephen wald goes on because the outcome of the war will supposedly have far-reaching consequences for the future of democracy, the future of Taiwan, and the preservation of the rules-based world order. Not surprisingly, they're quick to condemn anyone who challenges this view as a naive appeaser, a Russian lackey, or someone lacking any sense of moral judgment. Now, I think, without analyzing it for the moment, this business of support in ukraine props up the global prospects of democracy can go in different directions it certainly is going to have positive impact vis-a-vis -vis taiwan but i think where i agree with stephen is that it's not going to have positive impact on the sustenance of western democracy beyond a certain very limited extent why is that that's because the democratic decline the west is facing is much more a product of what my colleague mark Lilla likes to call social physics I don't, I don't use that term because it's too scientific, um, but it's to do with social forces which are untethering our societies rather than a kind of a moral failure. If democratic decline were reversible by moral rejuvenation, Ukraine could indeed have a positive impact on us. Um, but because that ain't, so it won't even if ukraine achieves a complete victory none of these claims should be accepted without qualification he goes on there's no question russia started the war and deserves to be condemned by it but the claim that western policy had nothing to do with it is also sort of silly democracy is in trouble in many places including in the united states but military setbacks abroad are not the main reason for this and a decisive victory in ukraine wouldn't and here i agree wouldn't restore the u.s politics to sanity wouldn't restore french politics to sanity wouldn't eliminate victor orban's blah 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 what's missing in this view stephen goes on is an acknowledgement that the morality 
of a given policy also depends on the potential costs of different courses of action and the likelihoods of success of each one. It's not enough to proclaim that the good guys must win, one must also think seriously about what it will cost to produce that outcome and whether it can be achieved. That is in itself in abstraction normatively impeccable. The question is how and if it applies to this particular conflict. The moral case for pursuing peace, even if the prospects are unlikely and the results are not what we'd prefer, lies in recognizing that the war is destroying the country and that the longer it lasts, the more extensive and enduring the damage to Ukraine will be. Unfortunately for Ukraine, anybody who points this out offers a serious, um, and offers a serious alternative is likely to be loudly and harshly condemned and almost certain to be ignored by the relevant political leaders. Well, of course that could be because they're making a misguided argument, but one thing I would say is that we certainly don't want to deplatform anybody who is making a contribution to this discussion. Hardliners, he goes on, have an obvious reply to these arguments. Of course, Ukraine wants to keep fighting, they insist, correctly, and we should therefore give them whatever they need. Ukraine's resolve has been extraordinary, and its desire should not be dismissed these desires should not be dismissed lightly, but this argument is not decisive. If a friend wants to do something you think is ill-advised or dangerous, you're under no obligation to aid their effort. And again, in abstraction, that seems right, because our um, support for Ukraine has to be predicated on a picture of our interests and on an analysis of the threat that Putin poses, not just to Ukraine, but to us, or to our way of going on on the international scene, and so on. Now, I hope that the hawks on Ukraine are right, Stephen says, but it's telling that these hawks are mostly silent on the issue of Ukraine's losses, and he asks questions about the extent and depth um, and uh, lack of knowledge about um, how much Ukraine has lost in all kinds of different ways already. So what is what is wrong with this sort of thing that we've just put on the table? What's wrong with it is that it's missing an account of agency. Now imagine two scenarios. Imagine something closer to what I think is actually going on. And then imagine an alternative scenario that is rather the sort of scenario that's implied in, in this piece. The scenario that's close to what's really going on is that this is a war largely prosecuted, in large part prosecuted for reasons of domestic politics. It's a regime security driven war. And what's funny, of course, is as a sociological observation, is that so many of the international relations contributions to this discussion cast this war as exclusively or overwhelmingly about national security. But the vast majority, if not all, in fact, in fact, I think all um, uh, Russia experts, legit Russia experts, um, give a great deal of space to regime security as a cause of war, Putin's conception of regime security as a cause of war, keeping power at home. So, imagine that this is number one, partly, in great part, the regime security war. Imagine number two, that there are major national security components to this war, but they're rather mystical. They are to do with a certain kind of mission that seeks to advance Russia from the back row of nations to the front via a provocative projection or several provocative projections of power. The aim here isn't Ukraine, it's the re rearrangement of the international order, of the international disorder, if you like. So, on the one hand, there is a story about regime security, 
And then also there is a story about um, national security being conceived in somewhat mystical terms. Um, we've discussed all of this many times. And in terms that, in fact, do not center Ukraine. Right? This is not primarily uh, about Ukraine for the Putin regime. And perhaps to that you could add the genocidal rhetoric with which the war is being prosecuted and the limited but concerning signs of apocalyptic thought in the Kremlin together with threats of global nuclear war that emanate from um, the Putin regime regularly. So that's a picture I've given you. I think it's fairly close to the reality we have. Put that here. Now put an alternative picture. Imagine that this isn't a... Imagine that the Putin regime isn't the Putin regime. And so imagine that it's a picture um, that looks very different. It's a picture where domestic politics isn't a big factor in the war and where the national security um, concerns aren't expressed in a mystical but in a much more uh, pragmatic way. And imagine that the escalation is clearly delimited. You know, we're not trying to change the international order. We're not even trying to bite off all of Ukraine. We just want a little bit of Ukraine here and there, certain parts of it, and then we're going to be all right. So th these are completely different uh, scenarios. Interestingly, it follows from the first scenario that suing for peace is a uh, on balance an idea one wants to avoid as far as possible. Perhaps one can't avoid it at a certain point, but one wants to avoid it as far as possible because that first picture does not go with the idea of a sustainable peace being available on the table, right? Um, the second idea does rather go with a sustainable peace being available. Um, but it's a very different picture of Kremlin agency. Now, it's the second picture of reality that is implied in this piece. And moreover, it's not even argued for. And it's not even said by Stephen that he's just going to assume that that's true. So, instead of giving us an explanation about why he bases his story on a delimited picture, right, that second picture, um, he gives it just as an assumption. I can accept this piece if it makes the argument that the analysis that I give of the situation, that most Russia experts give of the situation, is wrong. And that in fact the truth is closer to something like a Mirshaimian picture of, of this conflict. But this isn't even argued for here. That's a legitimate argument. It's misguided, but it's a legitimate argument to make. It's simply uh, implicitly elevated as an assumption that sort of floats behind all of these paragraphs that we have read. So that's the problem, and this is what I wrote in the margins. The idea that this is a delimited war is delivered to us not as an explanation, but as an assumption. Now there are going to be two takeaways, I think, that are worth um, um, extracting from this little chat that we've had. Um, let's make one positive and let's make one negative. So the positive takeaway is that even if this piece is wrong about this war, it can teach us something. And that is that, of course, we always have to be careful that we're not advancing therapeutic solutions to problems that 
are excessively based on moral identification and insufficiently based on um, real power effects in the real world. They're going to follow from what we do. So let's take an, an example here that I absolutely don't share, but it is made in some circles. The climate crisis is as real and perhaps more real than the science tells it is to us. This is an assumption I'm giving you. But the difference we can make by um, climate policy that tries to you know, fight it out for every point one of a degree of heating, that sort of policy is going to yield such a small difference to the final outcome that we shouldn't even try to do it. So we can admit that there's a real problem, but our response to it right, um, is a product of a therapeutic rather than an efficacious approach. That's an argument that's made by the um, probably the leading British public intellectual, John Gray. He thinks the climate crisis is even wor in a worse way than the science today tells us. Um, uh, and the science is itself beginning to tell us that that's the case. But he says it doesn't mean that we should have anything like the Green New Deal. That would, in fact, be a disaster. So I don't share at all John's view here, but it's, a, it's an example of an argument structured along this line of warning us about an excessively therapeutic approach. An area where I myself share that structure of argument is in, in the context of some of our identity-driven social justice projects. In other words, I think that some of our identity-driven social justice projects are going to get us nowhere near the result that even these projects themselves would like over a course of 10, 20 years um, relative to um, trying to get some of their um, goals achieved not by appealing to identity, but by appealing to solidarity. So that's a very important thing, you know. Um, we have to watch for not taking an excessively therapeutic approach that makes us feel good, but in fact um, doesn't have enough real, real politics. Um, um, in it. Let me then say something negative, uh, a, a useful negative lesson that we can take away from a piece like this. And that, of course, is about inappropriate modes of explanation being applied, right? I mean, you don't want to dress up in a deep sea diving suit and go and investigate the personalities of people at a dinner party. Um, we have a huge crisis of the compartmentalization of knowledge in our societies and we endlessly have projects, disciplines, institutions um, making significant mistakes by applying their own methods of inquiry to which are absolutely appropriate in some areas to an area where they do not work. And so um, that's a very important lesson, the lesson of reviewing a Thai restaurant from an air balloon. And you can review it very responsibly from an air balloon, but you're never going to be inside to try the lab guy and the pad thai, and you can't really taste it. Um, you can work really hard, um, but if you're at a couple of thousand feet, it just ain't gonna be the case that your review is is gonna is gonna nail what's going on in that restaurant. So, um, applying inappropriate mo modes of explanation, uh, modes of explanation that are, for example, too general in cases where more particular modes of explanation are required, that is a a problem in which we are simply drowning in our society, right? And that uh, this article is itself a very minor illustration of that sort of problem is, I think, constructive for us to sort of take away. Let's love talk soon.